Breaking down the New Orleans Saints passing game, run game, and defense, and how it all combined for their win against the Carolina Panthers. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on this Analytics Tuesday episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks, as always, for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. And don't forget that we're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube as well. I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, Canal Street Chronicles, Locked On NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked On Saints. And today is our Analytics Tuesday episode, so we're going to flip through a couple of different things to take a look at how the New Orleans Saints performed against the Carolina Panthers and how they sealed their win. Before we get to sort of individual things and looking at these individual performances, I I do want to highlight one thing. As we talk about analytics, one of the things that we know about this New Orleans Saints team here in 2021-2022 this season is that they ended up breaking the record or resetting the NFL record for most unique starters to take to take the field in a season with 57. So the reason why I highlight that is because one of the things that the Saints have done so incredibly well so far this year is win despite those odds. And so when you look at their level of production, even just in terms of win-loss, it's a big difference. And there's sort of a, a, a stark contrast between teams that are in similar situations to what the New Orleans Saints are experiencing right now, even in the modern era, right? Very, very recently. We're only talking about 2019 at the oldest um, versus what the New Orleans Saints have done so far this season. 2019 Dolphins were 5-11 and 11 with 56 starters. At 2021, the present Texans currently 4-12 and 12 with one more game to go, very likely to lose in Week 18 as well with 56 unique starters. And the Saints with 57 unique starters might end up with a winning season Right now, sitting at eight and eight, competing for a playoff spot. So, just something to keep in mind when you try to sort of contextualize how impressive this New Orleans Saints season has been, despite all of the adversity that's been faced. So, we'll start here with Taysom Hill, the New Orleans Saints quarterback, who I think had a decent game, right? A pretty good game. Didn't turn the ball over anything like that. Completed sixty point seven percent of his passes for two hundred and twenty two passing yards and a touchdown. The thing that I really enjoyed about Taysom Hill's game was how he how he sort of held the composure when he was blitzed and he was blitzed a lot in this game, 47.1% of the time, according to pro football focus, that's a lot of pressure to face extra blitzers to face all of that in those instances on 16 dropbacks. He was nine of 12, which included two throwaways for 144 yards and his touchdown. Again, that's 144 of his 222 yards coming when he was blitzed. So, Stuff you like to see there, right? You know the pressure's coming from one side, so there might be an option there. You also have some scramble yards from him that he was able to pick up in those situations as well. The other thing that we really enjoyed seeing in this one was Taysom Hill in the short to intermediate area, right? You and I have had this conversation before. He throws between zero to nine yards have been really effective for Taysom Hill, and particularly as he's dealing with a finger injury and things like that. No exception here this week against Carolina. 10 of 14 for 81 yards and the touchdown on the play action pass in the flat to Alvin Kamara that included also two drops. So it gave him an adjusted completion percentage in that range of 85.7, very reliable in those situations and got the ball out of his hands quickly, took only 2.14 seconds to throw in those ranges. Also, something I should mention when Taysom Hill was blitzed, the Saints offensive line actually held up pretty well, dealt with those still gave him 2.69 seconds to pass the ball there. So that's exactly what you like to see. Speaking of the offensive line and the pressure that they were able to kind of hold off in this game, I think the offensive line played well, considering what my expectations were for this offensive line, which was honestly that they might resemble a little bit of a disaster, right? You had a new starting center in this game with Will Clapp. You have effectively a third string right tackle in Jordan Mills starting, a second string left tackle, second string left guard in James Hurst and Calvin Throckmorton respectfully, respectively. And then you only had one starting offensive lineman who sees Ruiz who struggled so far throughout this season. And the Saints offensive line held up fine. 
12 pressures given up in this one, two sacks, uh, four pressures given up by Will Clapp. Not entirely surprised by that. One sack, one hit, two hurries. Again, it was his first time starting at the position, uh, and you don't expect to see him starting against the um, Atlanta Falcons at that spot because Eric McCoy should be back in time, so I'm not really concerned about that. Cesar Ruiz given up just two pressures in this one, both of which hurries, no hits. You had two hits allowed by James Hurst. You had a hit and a hurry allowed by Calvin Throckmorton, and then a sack allowed by Alvin Kamara on a block that he missed early. Jordan Mills standing in at right tackle, only allowed one pressure, which was a hurry. So a pretty good game from him. And then when it comes to the run blocking for the offensive line, a lot of interesting stuff here. Not super successful in the run game, but you saw more success in the Saints gap run scheme than in the Saints zone run scheme. So remember the difference between that gap run or man run block the guy that's in front of you zone run. You're sort of blocking areas of the field climbing to the second level if there's not an offensive lineman or rather a defensive lineman where your sort of focus is and where you're trying to trying to suit up there. So Saints running 10 plays in man blocking, eight plays in run blocking, or excuse me, zone blocking. This continues the trend so far of the Saints leaning more into man, which makes sense when you have you know, second, third, fourth string offensive lineman on the field. They struggled quite a bit early on in the zone blocking scheme. You'd sort of see them all take the one unified step over to one side, which is indicative of a zone blocking scheme by an offensive line. It's called a read step. And they, you know, would miss some blocks and a lot of penetration from that Carolina, very aggressive defensive front. So they ended up moving a little bit more over to man blocking. And that's exactly what ended up getting them most of their yardage. If you look at where the Saints got the majority of their yardage, should be no surprise to assume that you get 32 yards, a large chunk of your rushing yardage, which was only 73 total in this game between the uh, right guard and the right tackle. And then you got another 12 yards just outside the right tackle. And the only other area in which the Saints got more than double digit or got into the double digits of rushing yards was on quarterback scrambles, which was also very good to see from Taysom Hill. Very good decision making, very quick decision making ain't there. I'm running. So great to see all of that. And a big reason why the Saints were able to start to get some of those rushing yards in the second half was because of personnel decisions. This is where the return of Deontay Harris really served the Saints up something, not just in the passing game, but also in the run game. Because oftentimes when you see the Saints roll out there with three wide receivers that include like Lil Jordan Humphrey, for instance, or two wide receivers and the tight end in uh, Jawan Johnson, for instance, who I still think needs to get more targets in this offense, but we'll talk about that more in a moment then you end up getting heavier defenses, right? Base defenses, three linebackers, four defensive linemen, more eight-man boxes. Instead, in the second half, what you saw the Saints doing is using Deontay Harris as a third wide receiver, which forced the Carolina Panthers defense into nickel situations, lighter defenses. Then you started to see them be able to peel away and get more success in the run game in the second half, especially when they continue to run those man blocking schemes as well. So just a little something to watch out for in terms of how the Saints use personnel in their pass catchers, right, in their skill position players, not only to impact the passing game, but in the way that it can impact and free up some things in the run game. Remember Alvin Kamara two weeks ago against Tampa Bay Buccaneers, over 70% eight-man boxes he faced up against the uh, Miami Dolphins last week, over 60%. This week against Carolina, he was still in the top 10. He was ninth most in terms of eight-man boxes that he faced, but only 46.15% against the uh, Carolina Panthers. So you'll take that improvement for Alvin Kamara, especially when you see the big runs and the production that you were able to get from it. So that's New Orleans Saints passing game, excuse me, run game, as well as their blocking game. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about their passing game as well. Hit up the pass catchers and talk about like just three plays, two of three plays going a little bit differently. And we'd be having a whole different conversation about Marquez Callaway. That's how close this guy is. We'll talk about that and highlight the pass catchers as we continue on with our Analytics Tuesday episode of Locked on Saints. But before we get to that, sometimes it could feel that New Orleans Saints offense is sort of out of gas for a moment, which is something that you should never have to worry about. So I want to tell you about our one of our favorite apps here over on the Locked on Podcast Network, and it is the Get Upside app, which is going to help you just by simply downloading the free app Head over to select gas stations and you can get up to 25 cents back per gallon every time that you fill up. And actually, if you also download the app today and use the promo code touchdown, you're going to get a 25 cent bonus on your first fill up. So that means 
50 cents back on their your first fill up with the app the first time that you fill up. Now, the reason why this is important is because there are some folks that are driving a ton. Maybe you're in a place where gas prices are really, really high. You want to take $3.99, some places $4.99 down to $4.50, for instance, $4.49. This app can help you do that. Some folks getting $200. $300 back either via gift cards like Amazon and other brands straight to their bank accounts, even PayPal just by using the Get Upside app. So go and check it out. You can get it from wherever it is that you get your apps. Download the Get Upside app, but don't forget to use the promo code TOUCHDOWN so you can get that 50 cents back per gallon on your first fill up. All right, who today? So continuing on with today's episode of Locked On Saints. Thank you once again for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to check out our ultimate college football playoff season preview. It's not done just yet. We have the national championship game preview coming up on Tuesday. So make sure that you are checking that out. Get all the betting information that you need, some NFL draft analysis to watch out for in terms of the the top players that are going to be playing in those games, as well as, of course, the local experts as you get ready for the Alabama Crimson Tide and the Georgia Bulldogs. Big rematch from the SEC Championship heading into the national championship for the season. Go and check that out. Once again, just search the Ultimate College Football Playoff Preview wherever you get to our podcast. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the New Orleans Saints receiving options here. In particular, one player to kick us off, and it's Marquez Calloway. Marquez Calloway made a couple of really, really nice plays. In fact, actually several really nice plays in this game, including a couple of outstanding catches, two or three, um, two deep down the sideline, uh, 20 plus yards through the air down there and and you're seeing Marquez Callaway now kind of get into this rhythm and and Taysom Hill was asked about it a bit after the game and he talked about how that goes all the way back to training camp right Taysom and Marquez Callaway getting work in together all of that and um, Marquez Callaway becoming the the first New Orleans Saints receiver or tight end to go over 100 receiving yards this season up against Tampa Bay a couple weeks ago And then piled on a few more yards, things like that. Got 97 in this one, so almost broke 100 yards again. But the big thing around him is that despite the fact that he was so close, or even maybe amplifying the fact that he was so close or amplified by, is the fact that he dropped three passes. And if he drops, if he catches two of those three passes, then he's very likely in the 120 to 140 range in terms of uh, in, in terms of receiving yards. And so you you kind of feel like he's right there, right? He's right on the cusp, but he dropped a couple of easy passes, made a couple of very, very tough catches as well. So you just want to see one or two of those drops go the other way because in the playoffs, if the Saints can get there, you don't want to lose any opportunities. Uh, he was targeted 10 times in this game, caught six passes for 97 yards, averaged 16.2 yards per reception in this one and he actually ended up being just outside the top 10 for separation in this game now let's not forget there was no cj henderson there was no jc horn there was no stefan gilmore for this carolina panthers secondary but you know what the saints have played weak secondaries a few times this season and have not gotten to the level of separation than what we saw from marquez calloway who's really learned and really sort of shifted over the past couple of weeks and his ability to use deceleration to slow down, come back for the back shoulder throw down the sideline, those things. We saw the back shoulder um, kind of post route that Taysom Hill and he connected on against Tampa Bay. So it's great to see him sort of adding to his plan as a receiver and creating separation. Again, he was just outside of the top 10, according to uh, Next Gen Stats over with the NFL at uh, 3.9 yards of separation on average in this game. Just as a kind of benchmark here to compare that, DJ Moore, who is consistently one of the better receivers in the NFL, consistently near the top of the NFL when it comes to receiving yards, things like that, over the recent past at least, um, only 1.9 uh, yards per separation on average in this game. So just to give you a little bit of a a little bit of a comparison there. But it wasn't only Marquez Callaway in the passing game. We also saw Alvin Kamara get a little bit more involved in the passing game as well, particularly from behind the line of scrimmage, getting him involved at the perimeter. You saw the big 29-yard catch and run from him early on over on the left sideline. You needed to see that. You saw the Saint or the Carolina Panthers come out with eight-man boxes, two, three plays in a row. Then they threw that swing pass out to Alvin Kamara. He picks up big yardage after the catch. The very next play, seven-man box. The very next play after that, six-man box. 
That's why attacking the perimeter with Alvin Kamara and sort of diversifying the different ways that you get the ball in his hands becomes so important. And then you also saw one of the things that we sort of built into the game plan when we built our game plan on Friday going into this game against Carolina was the play action pass, the rollout and the dump off to Alvin Kamara all in the flats, right? He was the play action. He was the dump off and he ends up scoring the, the, the touchdown on the catch and run with that exact pattern. So those are the things you like to see them continue to do with Alvin Kamara. He was targeted six times in this game, uh, five catches for 68 yards and a touchdown. He took five snaps from the slot, five snaps out wide, several snaps, of course, from the backfield as well. A lot of play action in this, exactly the way that you wanted to see Alvin Kamara be utilized. But outside of the two of them, you didn't see more than two targets to any other receiver. Now, part of that is because the Saints weren't trying to throw the ball a ton. They were trying to run. They were very committed to sticking with the run game, as we talked about earlier. Just as a reminder, the Saints had minus four rushing yards at the end of the first half, and they turned around and added 77 to finish with 73 rushing yards on the day after the second half. Deontay Harris was targeted twice, made two catches for 23 yards, 11.5 yards per catch. He was really just impactful in the in the punt return game, fielding short punts, keeping the, the, the field position game going in favor of New Orleans, starting off in advantageous field position, short fields, all that. Still a 114 0.6 passer rating when targeted and a first down. Marquez Callaway, by the way, four first downs in this game on those six catches. Uh, you also saw Lo Jordan Humphrey get involved, Juwan Johnson get involved, and Adam Prentice get involved too. Adam Prentice ran, the fullback, ran for a first down early in the game and caught a first down or early in the game. So it was great to see fullback season come to life in New Orleans. Uh, just want, I, I, again, I would love to see Juwan Johnson get a little bit more involved. Nothing from Adam Troutman in this one. Nick Vanette was out. Uh, Juwan Johnson, you just want to see him get a little bit more involved in the passing game because when they target him, he comes up with nice catches. Now, there was one over the middle that was just a little bit too high for him, hard to hang on to that, especially when you're heading directly for a defender over the middle of the field as well. But you, you've, uh, it's hard not to like what you've seen from the Juwan Johnson connection so far this season. So I'm sure you'd like to see the Saints bolster that up a little bit. But my biggest takeaway when it comes to the receiving game is just the, the inconsistency for Marquez Callaway, you just want to see just a little bit more, just a little touch more. And I think he can get there, right? We, we all know, and it is absolutely no big mystery that I have a lot of faith in Marquez Callaway. I think he can be a good asset for the Saints as a third receiver, potentially even a second receiver next season. We'll see how that all ends up actually panning out over the offseason. But right now, if Marquez Callaway is going to be your number one, which he is as far as you can get this season, then you want to see him convert a couple of those drops and flip those over into receptions for first downs or nice yardage, all of those things. All right, so that's the Saints receiving core. We talked about the running game, the offensive line, Taysom Hill's quarterback play, all of which lots of positive things take away here considering the circumstances and the expectations that we should have had going into this game. Next, we'll talk about the defense. Much higher expectations over the defensive side and therefore much, much more sort of pressure for them to rise to the occasion. And I think they absolutely did. So we'll talk about Cam Jordan, Demario Davis, CJ Gardner-Johnson, and more who all put together more stellar performances over for the New Orleans Saints defense. But before we get to that, the Saints opening up now four and a half point favorites on the road going up against the Atlanta Falcons. The Saints need that game. The Los Angeles Rams, the other game that the Saints need, they need the Rams to beat the 49ers right now. The Rams favored minus six in that game as well. So all signs pointing to Good news for the New Orleans Saints thus far. How are you feeling about it? Well, one of the best ways to get in on the action is over at betonline.ag. Fastest and easiest place to place all your bets, whether you're betting on football with the NFL, maybe college football with that national championship game. You also have LSU and Kansas State tomorrow you can go and get in on. And then there's a bunch else that you can get in on. Volleyball if you want to. You can get in on the NBA, of course. Your favorite Vegas casino games, just a plethora of things that you can get involved in. So go and check them out over at betonline.ag. Don't forget to use the promo code Locked On if you are a first-time customer. That way you can get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Put down 1000 get an extra 500 in free play, 1500 for you to get involved with at the very beginning. So go ahead and check it out. That is a 50% welcome bonus with the promo code Locked On over at BetOnline, where the game starts. Let's get it. Houdat Nation wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints with the performance by the New Orleans Saints defense here as we continue to break it down by the numbers in this Analytics Tuesday. 
The big story around the New Orleans Saints defense is, of course, Cam Jordan. Three and a half sacks, 11 and a half on the season now, 106 in his career. <gasps> he is now a part of that 2011, or has always been a part of that 2011 incredible draft class. One of the best edge rusher, if not the best edge rusher draft classes of the, the NFL's history. And he's now second on that list uh, amongst those who were selected in that draft in terms of the number of sacks. So, and, and by the way, only nine sacks off from the official franchise sack leader in Ricky Jackson. That official number is 115 sacks. So that's where you're hoping, you know, that's where Cam Jordan's hoping he can get before his career is over in New Orleans. And I think he's got more than enough time to get that done. Because we're not just talking about this season, we're talking about next season and potentially even another season after that. We'll see how long. But anyway, when it comes down to what the New Orleans Saints did on the defensive side in the pass rush, they had Cam Jordan with four pressures. He's credited with four pressures, credited with four sacks by Pro Football Focus in that he was in on four sacks. But remember, one of them was a half sack that gets split with Quan Alexander. That's how you get the three and a half. He also had five pressures by David on Yamada, all five of them being hurry. So he didn't get his hands on Sam Darnold, but you also saw, also saw him make some good plays in the run game and all these other things, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. Same story for Marcus Davenport, four pressures, although he was held quite a bit by Brady Christensen. It was hysterical. Uh, Matt Rule on Tuesday spoke with Carolina Media and mentioned that he felt like uh, Brady Christensen took some really nice steps forward, and I thought, yeah, a lot of steps forward with his arm wrapped around Marcus Davenport. There were times where he grabbed Davenport around the waist, another time where he grabbed him around his neck, another where he hooked him over the shoulder. None of those called. So the big takeaway there, though, is not to complain about officiating. It's just that Marcus Davenport makes you desperate as a left tackle, as a tackle going up against him, and particularly in this case as a rookie tackle. That's exactly what you want to see from Marcus Davenport. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson also added three pressures in this game, a sack, a hit, a hurry, and a big sack too, right? In that final possession before he ended up getting the interception on the other end of all that. Um, you also got two pressures each added by Carl Granderson and Quan Alexander, and then one pressure each from Shai Tuttle, Albert Huggins, PJ Williams, and Malcolm Jenkins. So a lot of pressure uh, piled up by this New Orleans Saints defense, 24 total pressures. That is much better then what we talked about, what happened with Carolina back in week two, where the Saints only had you know like nine pressures and only pressured uh, Sam Darnold on eight of his dropbacks. Very, very different story this time around as Sam Darnold was pressured on instead 17 of his dropbacks in this one. And remember, last time that these two teams met, Sam Darnold was pressured on only 19.5% of his dropbacks. 50% of his dropbacks, according to Pro Football Focus, were pressured by the New Orleans Saints. That is huge, a huge improvement and exactly what we wanted to see because Sam Darnold did indeed struggle under pressure. 55.6% completion percentage through an interception. His passer rating dropped all the way down from an 85.4 to a 23.6 while under pressure. That's exactly what you wanted to see the Saints be able to do to little Sam Darnold. So credit the pass rush for that. Now let's take a look at the run defense. You had some pretty good play in the run game here. Uh, four stops by Shy Tuttle, defensive stops that came at an average depth of 0.8 yards down from the line of scrimmage. So less than a yard away from the line of scrimmage, he was making plays. Christian Ringo, only half a yard away down downfield from the line of scrimmage, made three defensive stops there as well. You got three more from Quan Alexander, who flashed big time in the run game. Quan Alexander, one of the big criticisms that we had about him when the Saints traded for him at the trade deadline was that he's going to give you a lot in coverage, but he's not going to give you a lot in the run game while well, he's given you a lot in the run game here recently. He also got multiple stops from Cam Jordan and then Albert Huggins, David Onyemata, and Malcolm Jenkins all made stops as well. So really, really nice stuff from the New Orleans Saints in terms of what they were able to do here in the run game. But great to see Christian Ringo and Shai Tuttle uh, continue to contribute to this team, not just out of necessity, but as a part of the rotation and trusted players on that rotation. And then we'll take a look here, wrap up with the defense with coverage. Paulson and Debo got targeted a lot in this game and gave up nothing. I mean, the guy was targeted seven times, allowed only four catches. That's a 57.1 completion percentage, only gave up 26 yards, including one yard after catch. So when a receiver that he was guarding caught the ball, Bam, he was there to make the tackle. That's huge. He also had one force in completion, which was a pass breakup. Beautiful play on the left side or on the right sideline if you're the offense. 65.2 uh, 
uh, passer rating when targeted. You also had a really nice save from Chauncey Gardner Johnson, only allowing one catch for minus one yard. Uh, and then he, of course, had the interception on the other one. He had an 86.4 coverage grade from Pro Football Focus. Not a bad day for Marshawn Lattimore either. Didn't hear his name a lot, which is usually a good piece of good news for defensive backs. Two catches on two targets, but only allowed nine yards in this one. 85.4 pass rating win targeted. Uh, Quan Alexander allowed six catches on six y- on six targets, 71 yards, but a lot of that came with yards after catch, actually 72 of those yards coming after the catch. So a lot of it was, you know, dump offs to quarter or excuse me, running backs out of the backfield with some yards after catch, stuff like that. So no big concerns there. So that's basically your look at coverage. You had a couple of other players that were targeted here and there. Demario Davis, one catch allowed on two targets for three yards. Uh, Malcolm Jenkins, two catches allowed on two targets for only four yards. So not a lot going there, um, allowing only a 69.5 passer rating uh, as a whole, the New Orleans Saints win at targeted. So great stuff by the New Orleans Saints defense. Again, high standards, and they have to live up to those, and they absolutely did. And speaking of high standards, Blake Gillikin. We're going to wrap up with special teams here. Blake Gillikin, five attempts for 215 yards. It's an average of 43 yards. Not a lot, but the Saints giving him a lot of short fields in terms of where he was punting. And so out of those five attempts, uh, three of them landed within the 20-yard line, two of them downed within the 10-yard line, and he had a long of 63. This kid's absolutely incredible. Should have been a pro bowler this season. Pro bowl snub right here when we're talking about um, we're talking about our guy in Blake Gillikin. But I'll tell you who was not a pro bowl snub, JT Gray, made a big-time special teams tackle as well. So remember that when it comes down to flipping the field, it doesn't just come down to what the kicker or the punter is able to do in kickoffs as well as in the punting game, but to be able to make those stops in JT Gray, absolutely phenomenal yet again and as always. All right, family, that is our look at the analytics, the numbers here. We're going to get into some more film watch stuff tomorrow, break things down a little bit more based on tendencies. We'll talk more about personnel, what the New Orleans Saints defensive line did that was so unique. How do they generate pressure on 50% of Sam Darnold's uh, Sam Darnold's dropbacks? We'll talk about all of that. And of course, we'll be joined by one of our friends from WWL TV for WWL Wednesday before we start to turn our attention to that Atlanta Falcons game on Sunday. So we got much more coming up for you here throughout the week on Locked on Saints. As always, thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day. I appreciate you so, so, so much for doing that. And of course, don't forget to go and check out Locked on Bets for your second listen of the day. Win yourself some money with your boy Q and handicapping expert. Lee Sterling. As always, for everything in between these episodes that you need on your New Orleans Saints, make sure that you're following me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.